the Association of Laura. Um, I'm honored and delighted uh, to welcome you this evening. You are very brave souls indeed. Um, this is a very special evening for the Association. Um, this is our annual Benjamin M. Cardoza Lecture. Once a year, the Association selects a distinguished person, um, a person dedicated to the law, to deliver the Cardoza Lecture. We're, at, we're honored that Al, Judge Albert Rosenblatt, a member of New York State's highest court, will be our lecturer this evening. We are doubly honored that uh, our Chief Judge Judith Kay has agreed to formally welcome you after I sit and to introduce Judge Rosenblatt. And we're triply honored this evening, uh, because this evening is remarkable for another reason. Um, if you look around you, you will see six of the seven members of the Court of Appeals are here tonight. And I must say that the only way you'll find so many members of the Court of Appeals in the same room is to argue a case in Albany. So I want to welcome them and thank them. Judge Kay will do the honors um, this evening. I do have the special privilege uh, of introducing what we around here call the former livings, the former presidents of the association. Um, <laughs> and as a current barely living, I'm, <laughs> I'm honored <clears throat> to recognize Bill DeWin, uh, Mike Cooper, Evan Davis, uh, I believe John Farrick was scheduled to come, I haven't seen him, but he's supposed to be here. And finally, Mike Cardoza, whose name brings a bell this evening for some reason. <laughs> This lecture series was created by the Association in 1941 to honor the memory of Justice Cardoza. Benjamin Cardoza was born in the same year this association was founded, in 1870. He served 18 memorable years on the Court of Appeals and last five as the Chief Judge. In 1932, he was appointed to the United States Supreme Court, where he served until his death in 1938. He has been called the outstanding common law jurist of the 20th century and was, of course, instrumental <clears throat> not only in setting the course of our state's jurisprudence, but of forging federal law in a pivotal period in our nation's history. Justice Cardoza described himself somewhat differently, and I quote, In truth, I am nothing but a plodding mediocrity. Please observe a plodding mediocrity. For a mere mediocrity does not go very far, but a plotting one gets quite a distance. <laughs> there is joy in that success, and a distinction that can come from courage, fidelity, and industry. Then New York Chief Judge Frederick Crane, in memorializing Justice Cardoza at the time of his death, noted that many changes had come uh, into the world during Justice Cardozo's time on the court. Changes which brought forth, and I quote, theories of law for which there was no precedent. The keen legal ingenuity of Judge Cardozo's well-equipped mind blazed the way for new interpretations as well as effectual solutions. And these decisions and judgments have stood the test of time. They have been rules which worked useful law, not mere theories. And beyond his being a great jurist, Justice Cardoza was a great man. Some 60 years ago, in recommending that this lecture series be created, our committee on post-admission legal education captured his essence by writing that Justice Cardoza was possessed of, quote, a rare character that radiated goodness, that was inspired by love for the law, a passion for justice, and a sympathy for humanity. It is fitting that our distinguished lecturer tonight sits on the court to which Judge Cardoza gave such memorable service. Judge Rosenblatt is the sixth judge of the New York Court of Appeals to deliver this lecture, including our current chief judge. They are joined by seven United States Supreme Court justices and many of the leading minds of the past three generations. And may I add, this is Rosenblatt weather. <coughs> <laughs> Judge Rosenblatt is a man for all seasons, no pun intended. <laughs> Not only is he a great jurist and a legal scholar, he was the chief administrative judge, a nationally ranked squash player, and what's fitting tonight, a ski instructor. 
<laughs> uh, I now have the great pleasure of turning these proceedings over to another very distinguished Cardozo lecturer, an extraordinary jurist and chief judge who is also characterized by a rare character that radiates goodness, who indeed is inspired by a love for the law, a passion for justice, and a sympathy for humanity. And as Albie and I know, you can't have a better friend than Judge Bay. many reasons. I am grateful to President, Judge, former Chief Administrative Judge Malonis, and to the City Bar Association. But very high on my list is the privilege they allow me this evening of introducing Albert M. Rosenblatt as he presents the 55th Cardozo Lecture entitled, The Law's Evolution, Long Night's Journey into Day. On any occasion, it would be a pure pleasure to introduce Judge Rosenblatt, a splendid Court of Appeals colleague and a cherished personal friend. But this is a very special occasion, starting with the presence of Julie Rosenblatt and the Chief Judge of the Second Circuit, John Walker, the presence of the entire Court of Appeals of the State of New York, Judges Smith, Separic, Wesley, Graffio, and Reed, I am so pleased to see all of my colleagues when the Albany <coughs> contingent, the clerk of the court, Stuart Cohn, and Vicki Graffio and Susan Reed entered the room. Uh, John Walker said to me, the family is here, and indeed it is. Uh, the presence of presiding justices of the first and second departments, Eugene Nardelli and Gail Prudenti, the chief administrative judge, Jonathan Littman, this is a first among Cardozo lectures, I believe. Then too, this is a very special occasion for my Court of Appeals colleagues because it is the Cardozo lecture. And all of us, maybe Judge Rosenblatt, just a millimeter more, are very closely bound to our former chief. And I would like to acknowledge as well the presence of his most preeminent biographer, Harvard professor Andrew Kaufman. But to us, to all of us on the Court of Appeals, Benjamin Cardozo is referred to just as plain old Benny. <laughs> and in the New York reports, the formal reports, we are delighted, each of us on the Court of Appeals, to link his punctilious prose to ours, as of course by law we are fully entitled to do. To add even further to the singularity of this occasion, as Judge Rosenblatt's colleagues well know, he has delighted, no, he has exalted in preparing for this evening. <laughs> Unforgettable forever are those excited calls all of us have received from him these past weeks and months, opening with the words, what fun. When we heard those words, we knew exactly what Judge Rosenblatt was working on. And in very short order, we also got to know the stage of his journey through history as he pursued his treasure hunt from the very beginning of time, from Genesis, past the Greeks and the Romans, and into the sunshine of the Enlightenment. Judge <laughs> Rosenblatt's scholarly credentials, I feel absolutely confident, go all the way back to his very beginning. Though I have not myself investigated back beyond his days at the University of Pennsylvania and the Harvard Law School, which is, by the way, the Rosenblatt family alma mater, all of the evidence points unequivocally in that direction, no doubt starting with the nursery at the Royal Hospital on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx where Judge Rosenblatt was born. Imagine, just imagine what would have been possible back then if only he had had access to a computer. <laughs> I know no one who more thoroughly than Judge Rosenblatt delights in the pursuit of learning, in turning every stone, in plumbing the depths of his subject, and then in sharing his discoveries in lyrical, well-punctuated prose, and sometimes even in lucid, perfectly metered poetry. 
Though Judge Rosenblatt lost precious moments during his downtime at the Royal Hospital Nursery, he certainly has had a full and productive life ever since. Following up his stimulating summers as a busboy at Grossinger's in my home county, with distinguished years as Dutchess County District Attorney, then utterly outstanding service as a trial judge, chief administrative judge, appellate division justice, and for the past four years, two months, and one day, thankfully and joyfully, joyously for all of us, as a phenomenal judge of the Court of Appeals of the State of New York. Whatever Judge Rosenblatt undertakes, he does to the nth degree of pleasure and perfection, whether on our court or the squash court, on the ski trail or on the trail of Sherlock Holmes. I could go on and on describing and praising this genuinely extraordinary, delightfully multifaceted human being, were it not for the fact that we have an even greater treat in store for us this evening than hearing about him. We can hear from him. It is my honor now to present Judge Albert M. Rosenblatt. So many friends. You're all in my you're all in my Palm Pilot. <laughs> it's as though it's as though the contents of my Palm Pilot leaped out of this and materialized in one in one room. <clears throat> but those of you who are not in the Palm Pilot, please stick around later because I'd like to meet you. And, uh, I understand Leo is going to be springing for wine a little later. Is that is that so? So you're lucky it's not Greek. <laughs> and I want to thank Leo and uh, Barbara Apatowski for this lovely setting, a wonderful evening uh, and uh, in this splendid hall, Rouge and Romano. And I'm pleased to see my colleagues from the New York Court of Appeals here, who I've told so many of you privately that I love and admire, and I may as well say it publicly, they're so decent, <clears throat> they have assured me that after I conclude my remarks here at the podium, they will not rise and present the dissenting Cardozo Lake <laughs> 2003. <laughs> so the links to Judge Benjamin Cardoza are everywhere, closest perhaps through Judith Kaye, our chief judge, who has carried on the Cardoza tradition, enhancing it with her own scholarship, her relentless pursuit and attainment of excellence and her wonderful sense of humor. And I see Andy Kaufman here. Most of you know that uh, he's not only a renowned professor at Harvard Law School, but after 40 years of research, he wrote the definitive life of Cardozo. I phoned him recently. Andy, I asked He insists that I call him Andy. What did Judge Cardozo usually have for breakfast? I asked him. Without a moment of hesitation, he said, it's at one, page 138. <laughs> and it was just as I had hoped. Oatmeal. <laughs> now, I had already been a confirmed oatmeal eater, but I soon began eating oatmeal more frequently <laughs> and in larger and larger quantities. I can't, I can't say that it has improved my writing style, but if I collect enough oatmeal box tops over the next 10 years, I can win a free trip to Philadelphia. <laughs> Benjamin Cardoza was deeply interested in the nature of judicial process, and so the evolution of the law struck me, and I hope it does you, as an apt topic, considering that so much of our day is spent on such minute things as researching a single point of municipal law or analyzing one paragraph in a lease for a shopping center in Queens. And take Article 78. We don't dwell on how the petition stacks up with Greek concepts of natural law or whether the argument springs from Magna Carta. All we know is that if you don't file within four months, you're out. But once in a while, we want to look at the big picture and reflect on how our American legal apparatus has been serving us. 
Our ancestor civilizations have been painting on this canvas of law for thousands of years. As Americans, have we improved on it? In a word, how have we been doing? I suggest we look at the origins and the themes that generated Western and American law and examine how the law has evolved over a recorded history that goes back more than 4,000 years. We'll make a few stops along the way and bring along two yardsticks. First, we'll try to measure how the law has advanced in comparison to the eras before it with particular reference to concepts of freedom and the relationship between the individual and the sovereign. And second, every so often we'll stop and compare the advance of the law with progress in other fields. But I think we have to be fair about how we make these comparisons. A plane, an airplane that can travel by instrument 2,000 miles an hour is an undeniable advance over Ben-Hur's chariot, or even Wilbur and Orville Wright's 1903 plane. But the law doesn't build on itself as easily as science does. Why not? If we can cure diseases that were once incurable, and in an instant compute what it used to take days, why can't the law make similar leaps? I wish it could, but the development of the law involves elements of philosophy, religion, governance, morality, and human emotions to a far greater degree than those involved in building a rocket or a faster, hyper-threading 3.06 gigahertz computer processor. Now, on a technical level, we've made enormous advances that are analogous to rocketry. Only recently, when we wanted to find a particular contract case or statute, it might have taken us a long time to hunt it down manually. Now, it appears on the screen in an instant. We press a button that says print. This is a wonderful retrieval process, particularly for those of us who are over 55. But the principle of law has not necessarily improved, and people still quarrel over contracts. There's also the element of subjectivity in any evaluation. Consider the arts. Some people still prefer Aristophanes to Neil Simon. And tell me which is better, the madrigals of the 14th century or a tune by Paul McCartney? And so as we travel from Orlando de Lassus to Bach to Beethoven to Brahms to Mahler to Schoenberg to Ravel to Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, have we improved? Well, for me, it's close between Bach and Louis. <laughs> but it's entirely subjective. Now, there are also subjective elements in evaluating whether the law has progressed, but I would argue that the question of progress in law is less subjective and more discernible than in art or music. And I aim tonight to explain why, in my view, the path of the law, in terms of our historical antecedents, has been generally and almost unfailingly upward, which is to say, more enlightened. Let me emphasize at the outset that I speak as an American, discussing Western culture in general and American culture in particular in the 21st century, and that not everyone in the world shares the American vision of freedom and enlightenment. As we've learned, there are those who would destroy it. Now, we've been on this planet for a long time, but for thousands and thousands of years, we went about our daily lives and left no written record of how we passed the time of day, let alone how we governed ourselves. The very first transcriptions of any kind are said to have been too We've been doing for thousands for that. We might call it pre prehistory. It's not a phrase. It's not a We said at some moment, okay, prehistory is over. When the bell goes off, history begins. Ready, set, go. But it almost comes to that because of the difference between prehistory and history. 
there came a time when we started to write things down, or at least leave pretty good clues as to what we were up to. We can't state with certainty how rights and responsibilities were maintained in the tens of thousands of years before the first written codes, but we can be pretty sure how they were not maintained. If there was a dispute over which group or tribe had the right to occupy a particular cave or a piece of real estate, we can safely say that there was no such thing as document discovery or the in-camera voir dire. <clears throat> Most likely it was force, pure and simple. But in terms of the internal organization of the tribe or clan, you have to think that there was some system of law at work, because if not, a small group or tribe could not function. In order to survive, it would have been necessary, we surmise, to create a program of rights and responsibilities being understood and allocated. It was probably a mixture of habit, arbitrariness, supernaturalism, and force that grew into custom. In primitive societies, there was no clear distinction between civil wrongs and criminal wrongs. And at least one astute commentator has suggested that that the introduction of banishment or outlawry as a punishment marked a critical stage in what may have been the origins of criminal law. Banishment was, the most, was among, the most, among the worst punishments imaginable. It wasn't like being expelled from Yonkers to White Plains. It would have meant isolation, the loss of protection of the tribe, and very likely death by starvation or violence. And over the centuries, cultures have controlled, or at least tried to control, errant or harmful behavior in a number of ways, <clears throat> including private retaliation, compensation, physical punishment, governmental coercion, demonic exorcism, banishment, guilt, moral suasion, social disapprobation, and by regarding certain behavior as sinful with the threat of serious afterworld consequences. Today, we're compartmentalized. Our shelves might house a red-colored book for the penal law, a blue book for the civil law, and a black one for the Bible. But I would conjecture that at the earliest times, they were all the same. <clears throat> no one knows when the first written legal tract appeared. All we know is what's been found. The Code of Hammurabi was written about 1750 BC. It's best known among the earliest of the ancient codes because archaeologists have discovered three earlier written codes that predate Hammurabi by several hundred years. And all of these cuneiform writings come from the same general part of the world, a region that covers ancient Sumeria, Akkadia, Mesopotamia and Babylonia, which is another way of saying Iraq, where civilized development occurred around 7,000 years ago. Looking back into this era, we're astonished at a 4,000-year-old written Mesopotamian code so refined that it dealt with bailment, negligence, agency, restitution, express warranty, consignments, domestic relations, and even eye surgery. I've read, the, I've read the Code of Hammurabi and its precursors, and so can you. The Code of Hammurabi is at the Louvre, and it's on stone, but it's also online <laughs> at handcode.com, htm, and I'll give you the full URL if anyone wants it after this talk. t-shirt that I acquired at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. <laughs> $8.95, not bad. <laughs> to put things in a in historical perspective, so let's pick our heads up from the Mesopotamian sand and look around and see what was going on when Hammurabi's laws were written in about 1750 BC. Stonehenge was the center of worship in England. Moses and the Ten Commandments would not appear for another seven or eight hundred years. There were reports of the first trumpet being played in Denmark. 
Plato will not set up his academy in Athens for another 1,500 years. Now, at the Hammurabi era, we might say that the stewards of the law were doing incredibly well, at least in the Fertile Crescent between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. In medicine, the Sumerians were in some ways advanced, but were also taught to believe that disease was caused by demons who enter the body and must be expelled. But they prescribed castor oil for ailments. The youths of Mesopotamia, however, were sure to know that cod liver oil had not yet been discovered for medicinal purposes. That fateful day came in 1854 in Norway. <laughs> the Code of Hammurabi is a fascinating work, but its polytheistic premise strikes us as alien. It's a document wrapped in theology through which King Hammurabi conveys the law as propounded by divine will. And he invokes a number of deities who were thought to be ultimately in charge of things. But Hammurabi must have been a very good guy. Not only because he has his own website, <laughs> he tells us that his laws emanate from an array of gods and sees himself as their messenger to provide just ways for the waif and widow, to make justice prevail in the land, to prevent the strong from harming the weak, to ensure domestic tranquility and provide for the common defense. Sounds like the United States Constitution. And someone wrote a book of, of comparing the phraseology. Can it get any better than this? <clears throat> After all, here's a ruler who recognizes individual property rights, sees a governmental ob obligation to the poor that's worthy of Article 17 of the New York State Constitution, and whose description of a bona fide purchaser was surely a prelude to Section 8.302 of the UCC. But Hammurabi's code also had provisions that we would find abhorrent. The criminal law was based on class status, and a man could sell his wife to discharge a debt. Also, if a builder built a house and it collapsed, and someone was killed, the builder's son was put to death. Now this is a guarantee of the highest grade of workmanship. <laughs> and it makes, our, it makes labor law 240 look mild by comparison. <laughs> but another major difference between Hammurabi and ours is cultural. And it's the way that Hammurabi and his constituents saw themselves in relation to one another and the world around them, and most importantly, the world above them, so to speak. The ancients saw the elements as having personalities. The wind that cooled the house or destroyed it was a person, and of course a divine person. The sun that warmed or scorched the earth was also a divine person and so forth. And as Abba Ibn put it, these gods might be benevolent, or vengeful, or constant, or capricious, but one thing was certain, they were always hungry. And this led the ancients to fashion practices, and in turn, their required observances with an eye toward pleasing a number of deities. Gods were unpredictable and could be assuaged by satisfying their perpetual appetite for roasted birds, bulls, lambs, and other forms of sacrifice, even children. Some gods and goddesses were thought to be at war with others. Actions that pleased one god or goddess might have offended other gods with different taboos or requirements or agendas. The Code of Hammurabi is surely what we would call a sense of fairness, but it was not founded on a single coherent understanding based on predictability as between the people on the one hand and the source of law on the other. For that, it took Moses. For the first time in history, the law, as embodied in the Ten Commandments, was to be cast on a fixed moral foundation. It was delivered in the form of a covenant in which the Hebrews, in effect, entered into a bargain with a singular God who would not act 
capriciously. God would protect the followers as long as the followers held up their end of the bargain by adhering to a prescribed ethical tract. <clears throat> the earlier religious practices were magical and the motivations were largely materialistic. Keep the rain god happy and hopefully the crops will be nourished. But with Moses, the premise was not magical, but contractual. And the motivation was not materialism, but rectitude. This was one of the most breathtaking breakthroughs in all of human history, let alone legal history. And in this setting, law was not simply imposed by divine fiat. It was the product of a belief in a principled bilateral contract, even though the bargaining power was perhaps somewhat unequal. <laughs> The Sixth through Tenth Commandments deal with affairs among mortals, and we can recognize them. The Sixth Commandment uh, with homicide is in Article 125 of the Penal Law. Stealing is in Article 155, and uh, the Ninth Commandment sounds very much like a mixture of first degree and perjury, first degree and second degree perjury under Article 210. As for the Tenth, there's nothing in the penal law about coveting your neighbor's house or spouse or donkey, let alone your neighbor's G4 iMac. But we've learned what envy can lead to. The message is clear. Don't even think about owning your neighbor's Lincoln Town Car. But what about Egypt? When the Jews took their exodus, they left one of the most advanced civilizations in the ancient world. The Egyptians were capable of extraordinary engineering feats. And it's only right that we ask ourselves, how a society so sophisticated, administratively and otherwise, is not associated with greatness in jurisprudence? We may never know for sure, because when the library at Alexandria burned, the fire consumed a good deal of the accumulated wisdom of the time. To the best of our knowledge, the Egyptians never developed formal codified law. It's arguable, I think, that the Egyptians had very little use for law texts because Pharaoh was believed to be God, and as such, his judgment came straight from heaven. The Egyptian government did include lower and higher court judges, and there was a chief judge whose position was second only to the Pharaoh, but it was a very distant second. This was not a system of checks and balances in which the chief judge administered the legal realm and Pharaoh the executive. The Pharaoh was God, and as such he was the state, and everyone served at his divine will. And as one historian put it, the authority of codified law would have competed with the personal authority of the Pharaoh. This may be a scholarly way of saying that if the law is not written down, it's easier to make it up as you go along. <clears throat> now it's possible that lawgivers like Hammurabi and the Egyptians ruminated into the wee hours of the morning, debating the eternal questions. Maybe they sat around the proverbial olive tree or around a fire, roasting the ancient equivalent of marshmallows, discussing legal philosophy, epistemology, Metaphysics, if they did, they left no written record of it. For the written record, we turn to the Greeks of the Hellenic world of about 2,500 years ago, long after the great Egyptian dynasties. If we were to chart this out on an imaginary clock and say that when we arrived at this planet, at say 12.01, just after midnight this morning, it's fair to say that no one began to record the philosophy of law until quite recently, say about the time we had dessert earlier this evening. And it was the ancient Greeks who prepared the dessert. And what a structure street it was. Pericles was the chef de cuisine. Plato gave us the recipe. Socrates asked a lot of questions about the ingredients. And Aristotle served it up for the world to enjoy and to add more flavors. If Moses and the Israelites taught us that we needn't be ruled by theocratic arbitrariness, surely we can credit the Greeks with expanding the philosophical platform on which our law rests. As one writer put it, the Greeks invented 
the revolutionary idea that human beings are capable of governing themselves through laws of their own making and seizing control of their destiny. What distinguished the Greeks from the theocratic monarchies in the West or Near East was the notion that the laws may have been divinely inspired, but were not designed primarily to express reverence for a ruler or even for God. The law served as a public vehicle promulgated under the authority of the polis. For the Greeks of the 6th or 5th century BC, nature manifested a rational law or design that called for logic and reason. And this is where Socrates comes in. Many of us know him primarily as a misty figure, drank hemlock. He was responsible for a method that law professors seized upon to drive first year law students to the brink of suicide. <clears throat> but it was Socrates who said that the unexamined life was not worth living and who equated rationality, knowledge, and happiness with the virtuous, lawful life. The Athenians held that chaos and unreason cannot explain the order of nature and that rules of conduct must rest on certain universal norms that are fixed and permanent. This was one of the first formulations of natural law. Aristotle was among the first to recognize, or at least to record, that as humans were endowed with the unique capacity to reason and the Aristotelian prerequisites for the concept of universal law, of natural law. What did Aristotle mean by natural law? He himself tells us. He was obviously a theater goer, and he uses Antigone, a play by Sophocles, to illustrate natural law. Antigone was the sister of Polynices. Polynices, who was on King Creon's bad list, was killed in battle. And so the king was determined to deny Polynices a rightful burial and to leave him to the buzzards. Antigone defied the king and buried Polynices, claiming that no king has the right to deny her brother a decent burial. This was long before Article 78 was enacted. <laughs> As to this, Aristotle made one of the most far-reaching observations the world has ever known, and I quote it. <clears throat> he said, Particular law is that which each community lays down and applies to its own members. Universal law is the law of nature, for there really is, as everyone to some extent divides, a natural justice and injustice that is common to all. Not of today or yesterday it is, but lives eternal, none can date its birth. How eloquent. <clears throat> you know, and in looking at the ancient Greeks, I confess to having to pause and question my thesis about that we progressed. The Greek culture was so rich in erudition, beauty, and philosophy as to constitute a golden age. Does that imply that we live in an age of jurisprudential brass or tin? I say no. It's tempting to say that the Athenians had it right. But we have to remember that in the Greek way of thinking, a person's identity was defined entirely by membership in the polis and that the fruits of freedom and democracy existed only for citizens. But the citizens comprised only a small minority of the population, and most tellingly, Athenian women had no political rights and were barred from public life. There were no women throwing the discus at the Olympics. They were not even allowed to watch. Even Plato and Aristotle slavery and the subordination of women as part of the natural order. At about 500 BC, the height of ancient Greek culture, 20 or 30,000 free men ruled over six times that many who were enslaved or disenfranchised. And we cannot forget that of the five most renowned Greeks, Socrates, Plato, 
Aristotle, Pete Sampras, and Leo Malonis. <laughs> the Athenians indicted two of them, Socrates and Aristotle, for what we today call First Amendment witch hunts. But the Greek contribution is undeniable. And despite these serious shortcomings, it is to them that we as Americans and as Westerners owe the concept of natural law and a glorious philosophical dimension to legal theory. But after the Greek golden age had tarnished, the antecedents were developed next by one of the most powerful civilizations the world had ever known. If we were to see the epoch after Greece as unfolding on a stage, we can say that the authors directors and actors were Roman. <clears throat> it was necessary to spent her days in war and conquest, she must have spent her nights making law. And we feel her influence even today in our own common law. And as Rome expanded, its jurisconsults like Cicero and Gaius transformed a Greek historical idea of natural law and abstraction into a cosmopolitan legal corpus that served as an equitable system for all of Western society. Roman judges were secular and not priestly. Law was a profession, and law schools in Rome grew and multiplied. The Romans gave us an extraordinary gift. In all the literature of legal systems before the Romans, there had been no abstract generalizations of the body of positive law. There were no commentators who treated the rules as a logically connected system. If Hammurabi and the Sumerians promulgated the first written statutes, the Romans produced the first treatises. Gaius and Cicero were the Wigmores and the Willistons of their day. Incidentally, I saw a bust, the picture of a bust of Gaius. He looks a little bit like a sort of a professorial Mel Gibson. <laughs> but as a model of law for all of Western society, culminating with the Justinian Code in the sixth century, the articulation by law of law by Rome must be counted as a giant stride in the history of law on this earth. Upward and onward, and was it close to perfect? Not nearly, for at least two reasons. Like the Greeks, the Romans also defined themselves entirely in terms of the polis, as opposed to the individual. But the Greeks seem at least to have had a soft spot in their heart for the individuality of an Antigone, who could elevate the natural law above the king's crown. The Romans would have made no such accommodation. In Greece, King Creon killed Antigone for her defiance. And as far as the Greeks were concerned, the king paid a dear price for his hubris. The gods would crush him. But to the Romans, natural law could not be invoked to overrule positive law. To them, Antigone would have made no sense whatever. The notion of natural law as a source of individual liberty would not arise until many centuries later. When the Romans spoke of rights, they meant property rights. They didn't conceive of individuals or even collective rights against the sovereign. And Roman law, like the Greek law, contemplated abject subjugation of women and slaves, which of course meant that most of the inhabitants had no share of the pie. When Rome disintegrated. Her luminescence was lost. The rule of law collapsed, and Europe was darkened. But it wasn't so pitch black that we had entirely lost our way. A pilot light remained, and over the next several hundred years, the great river of Roman law was replaced by a variety of legal tributaries that in one degree or another helped make us what we are today. Of course, we've drawn from Rome, but we've also drawn from the legal precepts of the Scandinavians, the Normans, the Anglo-Saxons, and other regional systems that fill the vacuum left by the collapse of Rome. And from these legal systems, the law of England, and in turn, 
our law was distilled. <clears throat> After the fall of Rome, the concept of natural law persisted in Europe, but the premise was different from the way the Greeks and Romans saw it. With the introduction of Christianity, natural law took on a theoretical character, a theological character through the teaching of St. Augustine and later through Thomas Aquinas. And in time, the concept of natural law became synonymous with church doctrine. A pagan sacrifice was by the letter of the law a capital crime. In England, the lines of secular and ecclesiastical jurisdiction were blurry and overlapping, so much so that during the Anglo-Saxon period, the bishop sat in the county court. Now, given the highly theocratic basis of law during the so-called Dark Ages, we can begin to understand that the process of finding the truth was very much bound up with divining the will of God. And by the ninth century, <coughs> trial by ordeal was used commonly to adjudicate charges of religious heresy or, more likely, sexual impurity. The accused was made to hold a scalding or burning object and the verdict would depend on the degree of injury which reflected God's intervention. The judge would wait for three days to see if the hand had healed. If it did, the accused was cleared. And in cases where this 72 hour period seemed too long for the crowd to wait, the trier of fact would employ trial by water. This carried immediate results. The accused who floated was guilty, and if the accused sank, it was a sign of innocence, even though it might have had other collateral consequences. <laughs> but these theological influences had a highly benevolent aspect that formed an essential part of our jurisprudence. Church doctrine altered the notion of endless personal revenge. If someone persisted in a blood feud after spurning a reasonable offer of compensation, it was regarded as an offense against God. And indeed, in the ninth century, the laws of England's King Alfred began with the Ten Commandments and a restatement of the law of Moses. This reliance on God was a feature of medieval law, and many of the discredited modes of trial were in vogue in 1066, which is for us a defining date. At that time, William the Conqueror prevailed in the Battle of Hastings, and England was to change forever. Our focus, of course, is on England, because we were an English colony, and in New York's first constitution in 1777, we declared that we were adopting the English common law. And so after 1066, a blend of English and Norman law emerged, setting the compass for the next thousand years years. This was to be our inheritance. The Norman Conquest gave us what would become the common law. It began with Henry I and Henry II in a systematized, centralized system of royal justice and it replaced the jumble of competing courts that included the crown, the church, feudal lords, and tribal practice. The Norman Conquest marked the beginning of one of the most extraordinary developments in all of criminal law. Offenses were no longer to be private matters. Slowly, criminal acts became offenses against the crown to whom the defendant was answerable. That was the state of affairs on the 14th day of June, 1215, a prelude to one of the most important moments in the history of law. By the 13th century, our ancestral legal house was made of planks and pillars supplied by the Sumerians, the Hebrews, the Greeks, the Romans, Anglo-Saxons, and the Normans. But the living arrangements had uh, a serious shortcoming. The king of England did not live inside the house of law. He was above it. And on the following day, June 15th, 1215, 
This would change forever when the barons forced King John to issue Magna Carta. The language most relevant to us is Article 39, <clears throat> these words, that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or exiled or in any way destroyed except by the legal judgment of his peers or by the law of the land that no one will sell, deny, or delay right of justice. Article 39 gave us the seeds for what would grow into the American concept of due process of law. The Great Charter embodied the idea that no government sovereign may stand above the people and rule with arbitrariness or caprice. Magna Carta has come to represent a turning point in the history of free peoples in their relation to the governmental authority. In that instant, the law we inherited was transformed from a device for subjugation into a vehicle of empowerment that could be used by the people against the sovereign or as protection from it. We might say that after thousands and thousands of years, the law was turned right side up. No person, no monarch, no ruler was to be above the law. It took 1,600 years, but Antigone's voice was finally heard. For the law, 1215 was also a remarkable year because by papal decree, it marked the end of trial by ordeal. The Pope who condemned it was named Innocent III. <clears throat> he condemned the ordeal on the ground that no one should tempt God by continuously demanding miracles to address the day-to-day -day problems that mortals should be able to work out by themselves. And after trial of, by ordeal was abolished, a system of disarray set in. How are we going to learn the truth? And so, Trial by jury was slowly developed, and we looked less to the inscrutable will of God to the more inscrutable verdicts of juries. <laughs> the exact origin of trial by jury is difficult to uncover and may well have been influenced by early Scandinavian practices in England. And although we sometimes joke about the jury as what it is, it is also the epitome of a participatory and democratic rule of law that stands as one of the most phenomenal advances in the history of jurisprudence. If there was ever time when it was necessary or believed to be necessary to have an omnipotent monarch at the helm, our forebears have spent centuries fighting the idea and have been winning. This evolution in Western legal thought was probably inevitable, and if it wasn't for John Locke, who helped pave the way, it would have been someone else, but it was John Locke, who in the 17th century advanced the idea that government, government is the result of a free contract among people who live free and equal in a state of nature. Under Locke's interpretation of natural law, the government is a fiduciary. What a remarkable word. The government is a fiduciary that exists only as long as it enjoys the consent of the governed. Think of the boldness of that idea. I mean, to us it's second nature. That rulers hold their authority over individuals in trust. And that when this trust is violated, a people may rightfully exercise their power to remove the ruler. It may sound treasonous, but to us, it was the working manual in Thomas Jefferson's library, if not at his elbow, when he drafted the Declaration of Independence. And in his second treatise on government, John Locke stated that the chief end of people putting themselves under government is the protection and the preservation of life, liberty, and property. And if these words sound familiar, they should, because they form our legal and political birthright. Our revolt against the crown 
1776 was not a power grab or a surreptitious criminal act. We looked George III right in the eye and said, here, read this, our honest justification. Now, over the centuries, there must have been countless revolts before this one, as when some insurgents may have overthrown a tribal tyrant. But never before had the idea been presented as a political or legal exegesis. In Western thought, it rearranged for all time the political relationship between the government and the people. If Magna Carta was a first step in undoing the divine right of kings. John Locke helped finish the job. But that was not all. At about that time, the law took a second stride of monumental proportions. For centuries, monarchs and governments imposed religious dogma on the willing and the unwilling. Religious persecution and bloodshed was routine, and if any monarch allowed any freedom of conscience, it was surely an act of grace, revocable at will. Once again, it was John Locke who in 1689 wrote in his letter concerning toleration, in which he said that church and state must be separated. He was a devout Christian who gave the world an unforgettable lesson in both Christianity and civics. He said that the care of souls cannot be long or be entrusted to the civil magistrate whose power consists only of outward force as opposed to inward persuasion of the mind. According to Locke, in matters of conscience and religious choice, intolerance is unchristian and illegitimate. <clears throat> if we were to look at what was happening when Locke was alive, we will see why we call it the Age of Enlightenment. During Locke's lifetime, Galileo published his treatise, John Milton wrote Paradise Lost, Rembrandt, Bruegel, and Rubens were painting, Stradivari produced his first violin, and Europe was introduced not only to Johann Pachelbel, John Wesley, Thomas Hobbes, Jonathan Swift, Johann Sebastian Bach, and Isaac Newton, but to fountain pens, chrysanthemums, cheddar cheese, and chocolate. Pretty good. <clears throat> but I submit that Locke's ideas have had as, as great an impact on us as the Brandenburg Concerto or the articulation of the laws of gravity or even chocolate. The ideas of the Enlightenment were in the air, but they took root in the soil of the American colonies. A century later, in 1787, these lessons were etched in constitutional, <clears throat> in constitutional stone. The chief sculptor was James Madison, who assembled Locke's ideas, along with those of Roger Williams, Thomas Jefferson, George Mason, and others like them, and in 1791 enshrined them in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Law had always been bound up with religion. Being on the wrong side of the religious aisle, even in Europe, could cost people their lives under law. By declaring that our nation shall have no official religion, the framers ordered a divorce in what had been a marriage between church and state that had existed for at least 4,000 years and undoubtedly a good deal longer. For a majority of Americans, it was one of the most felicitous separations ever granted by any lawful authority. And so as Americans, we entered the 19th century with potent ideas as to how to restrain the government. We wanted them... We wanted religious dogma excised from our law books. We also wanted the government to understand that it serves us and not the other way around. And we were fearful enough of the abuse of governmental power that with the help of Montesquieu and others like them, including John Locke, we sliced the government into three. For the last 225 years, we've been operating within that framework. 
but with every passing year and with extraordinary acceleration, we've redefined what we expect of the law. We've done this in three areas, and the changes have in some ways been so significant as to far out distance what happened over the preceding 10,000 years. Not surprisingly, they all deal with freedom. And indeed, in some ways, the history of law may be written in terms of a quest for freedom from one kind of oppression or another. In New York, we adopted a law in 1817 abolishing slavery in 1827. By March 7, 1857, the New York Times could report that the Dred Scott decision just handed down would be startling to the opinions of most Americans. And eight years later, on December 6th, 1865, we finally enacted the 13th Amendment, declaring that neither slavery nor involuntary, involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. With that stroke, this nation advanced beyond the assumptions of Aristotle, Plato, the Romans, many European thinkers, not to mention Thomas Jefferson and even the Bible. It's disappointing to see how long it took, but abolish it we did, even though we were not the first country to do so. We've negotiated the sometimes bumpy road from the Three-Fifths Compromise to Dred Scott, to the 13th Amendment, to Plessy against Ferguson, to Brown against the board, to the protection of minorities by requiring that any racial classification must meet with strict scrutiny, that doctrine that began humbly enough with the now famous Caroline Products footnote, but is now an established tenet of our jurisprudence.
made no pretense of providing for the equality of the sexes. In one of his lesser known passages, Aristotle declared that the female is inferior and that this necessarily extends to all mankind. Plato wrote of the wandering womb, which if left unfruitful, travels in various directions in the body, closes up passages of breath, and causes a variety of diseases later known as hysteria. Plato went on to say that women were the offspring of men who were cowards or led unrighteous lives and thus were a symbol of the de degeneration of the human race.